you guys. How are you? Hope all is well. It's been a while since I published a, an episode, and I'm happy to bring this one to you today. There's a few more before I speak about this one that are coming. I'm now freshly edited and ready to go. And it's beginning to get exciting, making connections with people in the off-grid world who are doing amazing work. And there's going to be a few of those coming up, and some other conversations that aren't even about building, which I'm also excited about. But this conversation today is with Peter McIntosh, who is a natural builder in South Africa, in the Cape Town area, doing some really cool projects with schools or creches or nurseries, rather, for young children who get to have a space to learn and be at peace um, in their early years, which are the, obviously the formative years. There's a very strong chance that another of Peter's projects will be starting in January of next year, 2019. And at the very least, I'll be writing about that on the podcast. And if anyone wants to get involved, then please do get in touch. Uh, there'll be space for volunteers. It'll be a great opportunity to learn. But there'll be much more information about that in the future, I'm sure. You can check out other work that Peter's done at the naturalbuildingcollective.com, which is a great blog and site with information. And without further ado, let me bring you this conversation, which starts quite suddenly. We had a sort of introduction between ourselves, and I decided just to start the show from within that. So there's no hi and how are you, it's just straight in to talk about scalability. Cover his natural building techniques. We cover scalability, as I mentioned, and how the city of Cape Town is becoming a hub for these kind of projects and hopefully can f become a uh, springboard for other projects elsewhere. So let's just dive in. Thanks for listening, as always, and see you soon. I'd like to get more scalable, and that's what I'm really trying to ask people about at the moment. And what I'm hopeful is going to lead into an interesting conversation with yourself because you've experienced in Cape Town of building buildings and having to fund yeah. them and all this stuff. So That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you a little bit of my background. Um, I suppose it all started for me in 1999 when I moved to a permaculture community in the Clan Karoo in South Africa um, and then confronted with the prospect of building one's own house and um, – as I got more and more involved in that process, I fell in love with natural building, which is not where I am now, but that was the lead in for me. And uh, in order to contribute to our community, which had a mandate for education, I decided that I would learn as much about natural building as possible and eventually come back to the farm and teach there. So I apprenticed myself for about four years with whoever was available at the time and there wasn't much happening. Um, and then went off into the world and, and started uh, building out of bales and mud brick and, and building um, mud brick domes and uh, vaulted roofs and all that sort of thing, generally experimenting a lot, um, often cooperating with other engineers who would go off and, and architects and we'd learn together. And then um, I, I decided to go to Cape Town to start my own uh, natural building business because I wanted to have done that before I felt I was qualified enough to teach, and I started building buildings in the in the peninsula in Cape Town in South Africa. And then after about four and a half years of that, I decided to go back to the farm, which was really where my heart was, uh, to start teaching. Um, but as these things go, um, I went back there, and there was just this huge need. And so I did start running courses, and then I started doing more and more consultancy work, and I got drawn more and more back into the mainstream in terms of building. And now I focus mainly on Cape Town, where I, I have a number of projects on the go. I've just completed building an early childhood development center in Delft. I saw photos of that, I think. Is it got a sort of tire around the back? Yeah, so what it was... A rising tire and bottles, and it looks beautiful. Yeah, so, well, there's two buildings there. There's an early childhood development center, uh, which is for about 200 kids, that the city designed. I was pulled in in the late design phase of that building, so I couldn't really influence too much how the building is constructed. 
Um, and then I tried to pull in as many ideas as I could there uh, with recycled materials like glass bottles, uh, hub, um, tires and, and trash and um, eco bricks, that kind of thing, and try to demonstrate as many of those different technologies as possible, putting it together in different ways. But essentially that building, um, its design philosophy was strange in that the tire walls themselves weren't load bearing and I needed to demonstrate a better use of tires, because clearly tires can handle enormous amounts of weight. So I raised funds to build a little training center on the side that's, uh, that reflects an earthship design more. I, I, I bermed it with some tires, took all the trash from the, the building site next door, threw it in there, built with glass bottles and eco bricks. Um, and I've just kind of finished that building. That was a long journey for me because it was essentially the first building that I'd raised funds for and I didn't know what I was getting in for. And of course, at the end of the day, the promises that people make aren't always kept. So you're left carrying the can. Um, so financially, that was quite tricky. You said you, you didn't have much to do with the design, but you used, I mean, it looks, it looks beautiful. You used bottles, tires. Compressed earth bricks mad bricks, all sorts of things. The aim of the building is a, a center for children, is that right? Yeah, so the, 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 that building caters for infants and children before they go to any formalized school. So we would call them nursery schools or early um, or kindergarten classes, but they really cater for, for the poorest of the poor because all the studies show that the first thousand days of a child's life are the most important and the, and the next early days are the next most important. And if that's mucked up, then nothing in the future seems to work. So there's a huge focus on trying to, uh, to get young kids that are in disadvantaged areas that don't have the stimulus into centers such as these so that the playing field is a little bit more equal. Otherwise, they're trapped in a poverty cycle, essentially. I've focused a lot on um, engaging in early childhood development centers. I mean, my mantra really is to keep things simple because life is so complex and you can get sidetracked. My, my, my mantra is really um, advancing the cause of sustainable building. And I know I can leverage my skills in, in a, any area, really, because there's such um, a lack of skills in, 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 in our um, chosen field. Uh, so I work with the government. I finished that early childhood development center in Delft. I was part of a design team for another early ch childhood uh, development center in the Strand, which is also near Cape Town, for 400 kids completely off the grid with power and water and sanitation built out of rammed earth, uh, uh, eco bricks, compressed earth bricks um, with living roofs, uh, that kind of thing. So the, the, there is buy-in from the city. What I find very frustrating in, in my work there is that I have to work with people from industry and um, industry's motivation is, is driven by profit. So they're interested in making as much money as possible instead of trying to do the best job possible. So we're immediately in conflict. So it's a very uncomfortable area for me to work in. And also, you know, as the world is, people choose professions these days, not because they're passionate about it, but because it's a tool to make money. So it's a, it's a hard place to be uh, and a very frustrating place to be. And I'm actually dealing with the fallout of that right now. It's tough. Wow. Let's dig in just a little bit, if you don't mind. So do you have any criteria for projects you choose to work with or not? Well, there's obviously projects that people come to me with and then there's a whole other aspect to my work in other words I create those projects which I haven't really spoken about yet so you know one of the things I do is I, I seem to have a good working relationship with the government and I have a few other projects that are not uh, related to early childhood development as well like an edu center in a in a, in a nature reserve also built out of tires and and uh, rammed earth um, these projects are all going out to tender now. So there's a dam that's about to burst because um, these projects are all in line. But, but what I also discovered that in order to avoid the conflict and the uncomfortable nature of, of my work is I approach the NGO sector. And now what I do is I identify early childhood existing uh, uh, early childhood development centers in previously disadvantaged areas. We call them townships. 
um, and then uh, raise the funds for those centers, do the design. But I have backup from the NGO world uh, that can step in um, to ensure that when I leave that the centers are, are properly run. And that's a much uh, more pleasant environment to work in, although it does have its challenges. You know, um, funding's not always easy. Um, and so I have I have two early childhood development centers, one that a design's uh, finished and a plan's being submitted, so I hope to start with that earlier this year. That's I'm going to build out of tires and glass bottles and eco bricks like we kind of have been doing because I'm pushing that technology um, so that I can make it easier for people to follow me as well because it's in the mainstream then. The plans are passed through council and that kind of thing. And the other centers, uh, the other center, I'm not sure yet because the design's unfolding, but I've got a university involved designing that one. So I'm, I'm bringing groups of people together. I'm building teams um, around projects. Um, and that's, that's my primary role at the moment. So what is it that lit you up about this? Is it the environmental side? Is it what it can do for people? Is it the long-term effect of living in a building that's sustaining itself? Clearly, it's all of those things. Um, we know the planet is uh, not doing well. And one has a responsibility to take action. And so if you're looking at the story for why I'm doing exactly that particular thing, I think um, I would be doing something else related to sustainability if it wasn't building. I have a love for plants. I have for a love for anything that's really off-grid, and, and, and I'm a homesteader by nature. So anything that uh, that's involves homesteading turns me on, I guess. Um, but it's really the fact that the planet is in trouble and that we all need to get involved to make change. And then, of course, there, there are all of those things like uh, creating jobs and employment for people, cleaning up the environment and all of those sorts of things. They all play a role. Um, I'm shocked at how little change is actually happening. And um, it is an emergency and people haven't worked that out yet. And so I also focus a lot on training because there needs to be more and more of us. I'm in Guatemala at the moment, um, helping on my home establish their uh, building academy. And, um, yeah, I think that's really what it's all about. I don't care whether it's about building or growing food. Um, it's just It just has to happen, and it has to happen now. There can't be any more waiting around. I mean, it's beyond. It's beyond. Yeah, there's nothing left to say, really. Yeah, you, you, the Italians say pushing down an open door, which is a, an expression that doesn't ex exist in English, but I, I totally hear you. I spoke to Matt uh, a month ago, roughly, and that was a great discussion about all of the work that they've done and, and the, their focus on, you know, Long Way, Way Home's focus on education and how they've had, what, students that are already, you know, spent 12 years or 11 years, I think it is, with them and how those students are beginning to go off out into the world and have their own effect. And that's where the scalability kicks in. And it can't kick in soon enough, whether it's saving money or saving or educating people and having that replicate. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things that, that I've looked at recently is, so the city of Cape Town needs 900 early childhood development centers, and then all the kids would be sorted. And if I could just build nine, then I would have done 1%. And if there are 100 people like me, there'd be no more problem. That should be easy to do. I mean, I can't see why it can't happen. And then, you know, just to get one more person trained and excited and involved, it just seems like such a mammoth task. You know, where are the 100 people? The doors are wide open. There's, in fact... No shortage of work. There's, in fact, no shortage of funding for these things to happen. The, the, the days of there being no political will are over. The only reason I can do the things that I'm doing is because somewhere back there, there are politicians supporting me. And so there's so much opportunity. And I really think that's what we should be taking advantage of. Uh, it's, it's, it's past the point where... Uh, you're looking for things to do. You're looking for things to happen. It's right there, right in front of you. And I know what hard goes is if I focus on a particular area, then all of a sudden lots is happening. And if I w withdraw my focus, then all of a sudden nothing is happening there. And that is just a lack of skills and a lack of people that are committed. Um, and 
I'm looking to change that. And I want to create some excitement around it if I don't get too exhausted uh, and if I'm not too lonely, you know. And then I, I, I sometimes feel in South Africa, I'm, 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 we're screaming for help. And then um, I've come to Guatemala and I see how much help is needed here. And then I, I sometimes feel a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah, that's something that I'm beginning to explore, that sense of, I mean, I've only done a couple of projects. The question is for me, when is this tidal wave of opportunity in terms of becoming autonomous? It feels like we need to get set up for if there isn't a disaster coming, but it's only the disaster that would really you know, become the tipping point. Um, and so there's the early adopters that have been at this for years now. Uh, you've got their model where they're teaching 300 students a year, yeah. and that's phenomenal. Yeah. And then there's the offshoots of that who are teaching. But there's not this sea change yet, is there? There's this question there. It's like, well... My feeling that the dam is about to break because I'm about to be overwhelmed. I mean, there's going to be a point in the next year or so where I will not be able to cope. I will have sucked up all this, the available skills in South Africa that I can lay my hands on. And, and so I can just see it all happening because these buildings that, are in the, that have been designed are going out for tender, are going to be built... And uh, it's the same for the other buildings that I've, I'm doing in the NGO sector. They're all coming on stream. So there is space for people to become more involved. And I think it should be a rapid upward curve. And the, the thing I like about this, the, the city of Cape Town is that there is political will for these things to happen, which, which I'm not sure really exists in other places. Um, they want to be a leader in the field, so let's let them lead and, and let's uh, let that light the path for everybody else, you know. Absolutely. It sounded like a lot is going on. I mean, I've spoken to Paul and Guy, who I imagine you, but you know both of them. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot is happening. I mean, it's somewhere I can imagine setting up a bit of land and, and a homestead and, and an education center and maybe reforestation or something, and just to see places thrive that have nothing going for them at the moment in terms of opportunity. It feels like there's the possibility to go a virtuous circle in that part of the world because there's so much enthusiasm and energy, and yet it's, yeah, as you say, maybe it's a moment for the dam to break compared to here where we have to wrestle with permits in a way that you wouldn't believe. South Africa is a heavily, regula heavily regulated place, and there are no standards written for alternative, sustainable, natural building. But there is this um, nice word in the legislation that says by rational design. So if you design something rationally, you are allowed to build it. And that's seldom understood. The, the, one of the problems with that is that there are only an, a few people that are allowed to do rational designs, for an example, a structural engineer, um, but also architects with special skills and other scientists. So there's a broad category of people that are entitled to do rational designs. Um, and obviously, it's a lot easier for me because I know those people. So sometimes I feel like we've got like almost the best law in the world because we're allowed to do as we please, and I don't feel the, the, the difficulty around it necessarily because I have access to these professionals that can do these things for me. But the, the average person struggles because there are maybe four or five people in the whole country that um, have, an understand, have, a, a, have a good enough understanding to actually do these rational designs. Um, so it's a bit of give and take. And I also know what happens in the world when these standards get written. Then you are locked into doing things exactly that way. So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of – I'm in this privileged position where we can actually just make up what we're doing, you know, and, and, and move ahead. What sort of um, sewage treatment and sanitation stuff have you guys used? Well, that's a tricky one because, um, well, as an off-grid person, then I just use a composting toilet. Yeah. And when you operate in a conventional setting, then the state would require a conventional approach to solving the problem. So they bring in these, I don't really know how to say it, there'll be a a turnkey system that they will implement that just costs an insane amount of money, but it does solve the problem. 
So it'll be a little plant that has gray water treatment systems and reed beds and all of that. But it's but it's big industry supplying that. And that is one right. area I'm not trying to break into because it's it's just a step too far for me at this stage. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what the earthships do so well, in my opinion, is they, you know, contain and then and then treat and have no overflow of sewage. It just needs more studying and then it needs to be uh, okayed by permit somehow, which it, which is difficult to do, of course. And it's a risky area. You can't have people, no. you know, messing up when it comes to sewage. There's a project I have at the moment of building a biodigester, which is something yeah, that's amazing. super beautiful. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Yeah, no, I have. But seeing seeing a flame out of organic waste is just super inspiring, isn't it? it it's Absolutely. so symbolic. Absolutely. Um, and so tell me about the, the project down in, in that you're working on now with Long Way Home in Guatemala. Is that the, the, still the school or is it a different area? No, so the idea of the Academy for Long Way Home is for the Academy to make a profit to help support the school. Because obviously you build the school and then, you know, you're left with the costs of operating the school. And here the state doesn't provide any support to Long Way Home. So they have to every month pay for the teachers, pay for the upkeep of the school, pay for the finishing of the school. So um, never mind the fact that you train loads of people, the academy itself could end up providing the funding for the school, which is a nice, neat, nice, neat model. Um, and what they're doing at the moment is one of the construction workers here, Roberto, is building a house nearby, um, a small um, oval a uh, tire building that's using it's heavily recycled they really are using trash to build that building um and it's going to be his home so uh, we've got some students here and this is the first course we've written a, a, a training manual M myself and guy wrote the training manual um and uh yeah we're having a blast uh building up a storm it's very interesting for me to be out here. I love how, what Long Way Home, um, it's a real response to the environment. You know, very often the world I, I live in is, is far more first world and you impose things more. In other words, you draft a plan and you purchase the materials when you build. Um, whereas here the response is amazing. They really have literally built out of trash and around every corner is something interesting and inspiring um and yeah our hats off to them I, I love what they're doing i mean i'd love to go and see it i've just seen you know stuff online but it's a, a very practical realistic project on the whole isn't it that's what's so inspiring with the building of roberto's house i mean literally we walked around picked up whatever was lying around dumped it on the building site and that's what we're going to use to build the house and it's going to be fantastic. And that, that for me is just uh, a revelation because I, I can't really operate like that where I, where I live because it's so regulated. Um, you know, they'd ask you all sorts of questions uh, that you wouldn't be able to answer. But here you have the you have the freedom to to do that, which I, which is just amazing. Yeah, that's what I'd, I'd love to be somewhere with that freedom as well. But as I'm, I'm similar to you, is in that I haven't got any sort of degree in building, and I'm just picking up and reading and and trying to develop my knowledge as I go. My skills are a lot more about bringing people together Absolutely. and organizing and staging and that kind of stuff. But it, again, it, I just want to do more stuff that can hone other skills and eventually create some sort of snowball that builds on its own. Yeah, absolutely. Because the funding side of things is always a question of asking other people rather than generating something. And that's a question we definitely need to solve, isn't it? I mean, uh, I don't know if you've read the Moneyless Manifesto, but it feels a bit, bit of a way off at the moment. Plans for the future? What is, what is the future looking like? You said you've got this tidal wave coming. Well, I just want to create opportunities for other people to fit in because a lot of people want to get involved. And very often they just don't, they can't find a space to do so. So my major role is to create space for other people to become involved. And I want to do that more and more and more and more. By space, you mean you, mean you have projects lined up and then you say, okay, you can you know, 
you tell people about them and they join in or how, how does that work? Well, essentially, I mean, I think it's two phased. I make myself available to the city of Cape Town. So more projects will happen. I always over deliver for them. So they're very happy to work for me because I'm not profit driven and I, and I bring funding into their projects as well. But also I try to enable things to happen that wouldn't have happened in the first place, like approaching NGOs. I mean, one of the one of the ways you can make it happen is to sit down with somebody who's who, who a big NGO who's doing a lot of development, you know, and you start having a conversation about sustainability and global warming, and they all they're with you all the way. And then it's not a big step to say, well, you know, uh, building is twenty percent of the world's uh, GDP. And uh, there's a lot of carbon emissions related to that. And so the logical thing then to do is if you've got any development happening, just do it out of sustainable materials. Uh, And so it's quite an easy conversation to have because it's logical and makes sense. And you're dealing with people, you're already preaching to the converted. So I'm able to get projects off the ground um, because it's, it's 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 a logical next step. And I could create more, create more projects, create more opportunities for other people. And at the same time, uh, get a, a body of knowledge uh, going on the ground with buildings. Uh, you know, that's, that's my focus. That sounds fantastic. Make it easier for people to follow because if there are tire buildings built already and they have been passed through the relevant processes, then it is easier for people to follow. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of times people just don't do things because they don't think it's possible. Um, and that's my job. So what kind of design, when you design a building like the one you've just done now, they have all the tires drawn in, the architectural drawings are all included, or how, how does that work? Well, how, how, does, how does the design process work? Well, it might be built out of many different types of material, whether it's round earth or tires. But um, I have taught a number of architects over time because they come on my courses because they're accredited. So I I then approach an architect that I I think might be right for that building. And then we sit down and we we do the design work for the buildings. Oh, fantastic. So that's what then presented to be signed off by the authorities. And I'm also lucky now to have had engineers through my courses. So I have a you know, I have them as well because actually, in a sense, they're the most important person because the process is by rational design. And so it's a calculation that an engineer would provide. Um, so I, I have, I try to spread the, the work around because you can ask an architect once for free, but the next time it's tough, you know. Yeah. So I have worked up a, a, a big network of people so I can spread the risk and the load around. But I find also that once once they've done one, they're willing to do two and three and four, and pretty soon they're spending half their time working for nothing, which is great. That's amazing. It would be so nice if people could work for decent salaries doing good stuff as well. That's so illogical, this thing about doing good work being for free. If I didn't work 80% of the time, and I'm just saying 80% of the time, it's more, I have to work for nothing. Because if I didn't, it wouldn't happen. But what I try and do... Um, is I try then create the space for other people to be paid. I'm lucky. A lot of people do support me. Look, I'm broke, but I have a I have an amazing lifestyle. I have more food than I can eat. I have I have a, a, a I built a little brewery. I have more beer than I can drink. I have, you know, I have a, a really good life. But it's it's tough being in the position that we are in, being leaders um, and trying to create the space for others. The truth is that you have to do this stuff for nothing. That's what's happening right now. But I know when these buildings are being built, it, people do get paid. So, you know, one's always reaching for the next project to begin because that's, you know, that's where you can help support people. And that's, that's where you can pay people. It's a tough nut to crack. It's something it's that tough. I think a lot about. Sometimes I cry, but I, uh, and, you know, the, the, yeah, the darkness yeah. is great as just before the dawn. So... You know, when, you, when you're really feeling the pinch, you know that the relief is just around the corner and it just keeps going like that. Well, I mean, studying the economics of it a little bit more and looking at how much the buildings cost, how much they save over time, what other more difficult to quantify benefits there are, it would be great to sort of be able to present that to larger donors at some point or to maybe collaborate on doing something like that, a sort of report that spells out the benefits and gets bigger funding 
Yeah, what I think is, what I think people are missing is that um, we don't actually need any funding. All we need to do is moving forward, do the right thing, because things are getting built all the time. So the approach needs to be, let's just do it the right way instead of doing it the wrong way. You don't need any funding. So that's one approach that I'm starting to see that makes sense. All you need to do is really convince people that global warming is real, uh, show them the figures, and then uh, and, and show them the quality of the buildings that you produce that are healthier, have a, a greater social impact, are more inspirational, and, and then you actually don't have a problem. And that's the point I'm working towards where we don't need to ask for funding because we shouldn't need to be funded. The infrastructure should be built in a sustainable manner right from the word go anyway. So that's, the, that's, that's what I'd like to see happen because then truly uh, there'll, there'll be things happening just everywhere instead of – and I, mean, I understand the need to be funded. For example, if you're working uh, – if you, if you do identify a crash in a township – that needs to be upgraded. You are going to need to raise funds, but we need to be nailing it from the other direction as well, that all buildings should be built this way, period. Yeah, I totally agree. It's an interplay, isn't it, between the permitting needs and the difficulties there and helping people get going with this stuff and showing them one example where the dominoes can start falling. Yeah. Mixing that with buildings that all buildings cost money and people pay for buildings all the time. So I see what you mean about them not being needed to fund. And then mixing that with these cross-cutting issues like gender and, and health or what on education, etc. And having those people are naturally the most open to these buildings in the first place. They've already bought the idea, haven't they? Yeah, that's, that's quite right. Yeah. For me personally, it's just been amazing to speak to different people and hear of the kind of stuff that's going on, whether it's, uh, you know, from the States or South Africa or Guatemala or wherever. There's definitely this swell happening in terms of off-grid stuff and humanitarianism. I mean, I know there are dark moments, but it does feel like something's happening, no? Absolutely. There's no doubt that um, I, I, it strikes me when you speak to young people as well, they know exactly what you're talking about. And for me, that's, uh, there's so much hope there. Oh, man. Well, listen, I'm not going to take too much more of your time, but let people know, you know, what they can do, if, if anything, to support you. Uh, where would you want to be contacted with? Are there people you're missing in terms of jobs or skills that you need? I mean, anything that can help what you do. I think we're okay, actually, at the moment. My big deal is going to be some builders that uh, can operate independently. That's what I'm really going to need in the not too distant future. Um, I've got this feeling that we're we're going to be inundated and we have the skills in terms of engineers and architects. I don't think that's a problem. What we, the skills that we're lacking um, are the very skills that you and I bring. We need more people like you and I uh, on the ground. And I know that I am not going to be able to find all of those people in South Africa. But what shocked me, uh, I was hoping to look outside of our borders, but the moments like just looking at Guatemala and seeing how much need there is here and how much need there probably is absolutely everywhere, that's not going to be an easy task. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, uh, there's some parts of the world, especially these refugee camps, for instance, that could use so much help in terms of building structures that can just support people without the infrastructure. It's literally, we're talking about sanitation, water collection, nutrition, that to me seems to be one of the places where there are dire need. I mean, it's horrible trying to qualify or compare needs around the world, but um, there's, there's definitely yeah a lot of a lot of choice out there for places that need it. Well, I'd like to think that we could talk again, maybe also privately, yeah, about the possibility of bringing people or getting people together for a project because that's something that I love doing. Also, one of my goals is is to create a concentration of our efforts to not dilute things too much, which is why I'm focusing um, on the city of Cape Town as well. Because, you know, you can do a project here, you can do a project there. And you and I both know there's millions of people all over the world that are th we are thinking the same, but it's so scattered. And, um, and I understand how this podcast can help bring people together. 
Um, but I'd like to create a concentrated body of work because I think that might um, you, one can leverage that. I agree about the scatteredness. I mean, the idea is often to go and pass on, uh, you know, knowledge transfer and stuff. But you need to work on four or five or six or even ten buildings before the the machine gets really well oiled and people teams begin to splint off and, exactly. and, and so, multiply. Uh, so yeah, I totally hit, can't hear what you're saying there. So that's going to be my strategy: is to to do exactly that, to create space for people. Um, yeah, get as many people involved as possible um, and, and concentrate that effort. And then from there, it can grow. And also, if, if you get things going in a place like the city of Cape Town, then there are other centers in South Africa that, that will want to follow, you know. So I'm, tr- I'm trying to – I've taken myself and I'm just going to try and leverage things as much as possible. And so I'm being quite careful in my approach. Well, listen, if there's any way I can help you, let's talk about it or stay in touch. It's great to speak to people like you, I must say. It does feel like there's a lot of people like us around. What I love is that when when people get together, that's when the energy starts to build and stuff happens. So I know this is remote, but by all means, let's make it happen. Yeah. Let me say goodbye and thank you so much for taking the time. I know you guys are doing so much out there. But yeah, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you. I wish you all the best. We'll, We'll speak again soon. for sure. Yeah, you too. Go well. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Before you go, or rather immediately after you've gone, please go down to iTunes, leave a review, help us grow, get more guests, raise more money for projects. We have other projects coming up. You can find news about those on offgrid.vision, where you can also get access to other shows and some phenomenal t-shirts, which go towards, well, the profit of which goes towards new projects. If you have any requests for someone to come on the show, do let me know via the site. Until next time, thanks for listening, and see you soon. Mm